Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Oh So Spurs podcast. Um, this is probably not the voice you're used to hearing because we are without our fearless leader, Jim. Um, he is away doing bigger and better things. Not that there are many things better than this podcast, but they managed to find one of them. Uh, I am here after one of the things that definitely was not better, um, the game, <laughs> the West Ham game. Uh, I'm here with uh, Stu. How are you doing, Stu? All good, as you can see from the bags under my eyes, less than four hours sleep after that lovely game last night, and uh, really happy about it. <laughs> you might be the only Tottenham fan that feels that way. Uh, how about you, Johnny? How are you doing? I'm great, Deej. How are you, man? I'm, I'm doing as best as I can after a performance like that. I guess we can yeah. go ahead and jump straight into it. Um, Stuart, you, you sacrificed the most to watch that game, I think, so we'll let you talk about it first. How do you, what do you yeah. think of the overall performance? I, I thought the, the first 30 minutes was brilliant. Um, you know, I thought we were creating chances. West Ham couldn't get their, you know, their foot on the ball. We were just playing with them. And in a way, it, it reminded me of the preseason game where we also wiped the floor with them and they also came away with an unrealistic win. Um, and I, it, I kind of had that worry at half time when we went in only 1-0 up. You know, thinking... As always, and we've all been scarred by this. How many games have we seen where we haven't taken our chances and been punished? Um, and unfortunately, in the second half, it you know came to fruition. I I, I just don't understand what happened because at halftime against City, Ange had a go at them, and it was a brilliant second half. And here, I don't know if it was complacency uh, with the players, which Ange kind of seemed to reference in the post-match presser. Um, or what, but or what changes they made, you know, maybe DJ, you can go into that. But that second half was, was you know, appalling. Um, we just didn't seem to create as many chances, weren't able to dominate, and we got punished. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I'll, I mean, I think that a lot of the changes weren't necessarily out us like making changes. I think it was more West Ham making changes and us failing to adapt. I think that's the issue of any team going up 1-0 is you give the opposing manager a chance to kind of change what they saw was working for your opposition and then go out and try to counter that in the second half. But if you're up 1-0 at half, you can't then go in. You have to kind of guess what kind of tactical changes the other manager is going to make. And you don't have as much leeway to kind of figure uh, to f- kind of figure out what you need to do to counter their counter, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of hurt us. Also, to be completely fair, even with their tactical changes that allowed them to get a bit of a foothold in the game, it's not like they created two goals. No. They were no. they were given one of the luckiest bounces, or I guess bounce, yeah, one of the luckiest bounces I've seen all season, and then just a complete moment of madness from from Yudogi, which. You know, mistakes happen, but it's not like the mistakes were because of anything West Ham did particularly well. All Thank credit you. to them. They set up in their low block and they managed to stall out our attacks. They played a great game. They played it directly to their game plan, but I don't think that they're, I don't think that it's necessarily something we need to worry about on the defensive side of the ball in particular. Yeah. I think it's just two mistakes. We don't need to read too much into it. Mm. How'd you feel about the it, game, Johnny? Uh, well, I certainly agree with everything you guys have already said. I mean, I suppose there's a few few different things you said about um, ridiculous lucky bounce. Like there was, that, if you think about it, there were two lucky bounces, weren't there? Because the way the ball came off yeah. the post went landed straight in front of Ward Prowse as well, and that could have gone anywhere. Also, if it, if it bounced down to Jared Bowen, I think it was he would have been offside. So there's like. You know, it is sort of the the Spursy kind of. Uh, we don't use that word very often these days, but like, it was very Spursy the way that that transpired as well. I mean, uh, it's it's very much like Stu was saying, rinse and repeat. We've got a very we've got a sort of pattern of developing now, especially with with home games. But even the away game, like I know Wolves, we had an amazing five minutes, but most of the other games. At the, at the start of the game, most of the other games were were straight out of the blocks and were absolutely pounding teams. I think even after twenty minutes yesterday, we had over ninety percent possession after yeah. after twenty minutes. That's absolutely ridiculous. And they were like, I mean, if it was a boxing match, you would. I know if it's one nil, you're not going to be calling time. 
but they were absolutely shell shocked uh, West Ham, and, and you've got to respect actually their ability to hang in. Very organised, obviously. David Moyes knows what he's doing, and you know they're they're a handy enough team. But we were absolutely destroying them. But yeah, it was. Um, we were saying before the saying before we started recording there about not putting away chances. It isn't even so much about the the, the number of chances we weren't putting away. We just weren't quite getting to that to creating the chances. Like there were lots of attacks. The whenever the sort of moment came to pull the trigger or to make the final pass, there was a, a sort of like Andrew saying a lack of conviction and um, apparent sort of like this. Particularly, I think Brennan Johnson was the most obvious, but also Decky was a little bit more like he had been early in the season, but just kept doing the same thing over and over and. It was clearly, you know, when they're they've got nine men, ten men behind the ball, it was like very, very difficult. And um, I suppose the 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 most disappointing thing is how poor the second half was. And the last thing I would say that I think I'd kind of like to get into a little bit is just like as a supporter, and uh, we we're all obviously all really um, invested, and we, we we've all got our own perspectives on things, but and 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 we're not all going to agree all the time, but. The, the response afterwards to the tweet, I, I was kind of disappointed or, or perplexed. I, uh, yeah, we've potentially going into, we've gone to five games without a win. Uh, we've had three defeats in a row at home. Like it all sounds really bad and it's not what any of us want, but it's like we suddenly stopped seeing the big picture and what we were all going mental about. And I was at, at the Chelsea game. And the level of sort of worship of Adam Postagoglu at that pre pre match was ridiculous. I've never seen anything like it in all the years I've been going there. And now now there's people not like questioning his legitimacy to be there or anything like that. But there's all those questions being asked that I just think are completely out of perspective and losing the plot when it comes to the reality of the situation. And I I I don't know um, how you guys feel, but I just. I think there's so many positives. Like there are lots of mitigating circumstances, and there's a shitload to be um, optimistic and positive about. Because like remember last year when we had the same stuff happening, we we were um, we were going game after game without shot and target. At least we're getting yeah. some glorious football. You know, it, albeit it was quite very much in the one half yesterday. Sorry, a bit of a bit of a monologue there, but yeah, there's there's. We all care so much, but it's it's yeah. it's a it's a puzzle, and I suppose it's a worry because we got Newcastle as well on Sunday, and you know that it's certainly far from an easy game, even though they lost comprehensively as well yesterday. I think you're right. I think you know I, I've seen a lot of people you know questioning you know one point five and and it's, you know unacceptable, and you know you know who cares about the nice football and you know and people pointing even and just saying I'm not here for the good football, I'm here for the results, you know look. And I'm like, yes, but it all starts with the football. You can see that he's putting down the foundations that once we get the players back and that better quality players, that will then transpire into scoring goals, which then brings the three points, etc. So it's not like, as you referenced, you know, the, the Conte, not a shot on target and losing. I mean, it's just worlds apart. I mean, I, I can't see how anyone can question the direction we're going as a club under this manager. Um, I think someone who kind of, I think, epitomized his performance was Hoiberg when he fell over trying to cross the ball. Um, you know, he is not an Ange player. You know, how many times did he have the ball and he wasn't quick enough moving it along, etc. So, you know, you can see where we're going, but it's going to take another couple of windows before we've got a squad that's able to play the game. But you can see what game we're going to play. So I can't see how anyone is questioning where we're going and is, you know, starting to get nervous about our future. Yeah, I think that nothing really, I think the thing that really, uh, you said Hoybeer kind of epitomizes it. I think that the thing that really shows that both we know what we're doing and we have a, a bit of a ways to go in terms of personnel is looking at our attacking heat map. Uh, a good oh, yeah. chunk of our attacks came down the right because yeah. we had players in. Pedro Poro and Kulisevsky, who mm. can hypothetically at least put a cross in. Uh, for some reason, Kulu wasn't doing the thing that he's done so effectively before of getting somewhere where he can just whip a ball in and over until it mm. was a bit too late. 
but we just don't have, we didn't have that player on the left in this game because Udogi in the formation, in the, the tactical like formation, he comes as an inverted fullback um, like he's supposed to, but that means that he's not going to be in the position to make a cross. And Brandon Johnson just wasn't, wasn't putting those balls into the area either. So that kind of left us with no choice but to go either to Poro and just have him whip something in or Kulisevsky and have him, I guess, dribble in and then end up stalling the attack out. Um, which I think kind of shows what I think our biggest priority needs to be in the January window. And that's just anyone who can take someone on, preferably someone down the left. Because I think that having Poro as a non-inverted fullback is good because of just the quality of ball he can put in. So I think having someone who we can kind of vary our attack with on the left um, would be really important. But honestly, just anyone who can beat a man 1v1. Because we had so many opportunities where Ange Ball just creates the overloads and then you swing it out to the other side and you get the 1v1. Mm. But we just didn't have that player who could take the man on 1v1, who had the confidence to take the man on 1v1, because we did it a couple times, but then you would you would get strapped once, and then the it wouldn't happen again for another 10-15 minutes. Uh, I just think that we just need that one player, like a Doku type at City, obviously not, maybe a little less expensive than that, but I think um, what someone you of that caliber. In the group chat earlier today, Deej, it was, you know, something that I think most people have forgotten is how much we miss Perisic. He was going to be such a key player on the left. He was, last season, he didn't even play that much. Um, and he had to get the most assists out of pretty much anyone in the squad. Um, and the beginning of this season, he was on fire, perfect crosses. I mean, the man is so experienced, so good at it. Seemed to have a good rapport going with, with Sonny. Um, and then, again, we haven't really mentioned his, his backup was Solomon who we lost after one game. And he is a man who's able to take a, a man on and take a player on. So I think everyone seems to forget, just thinks, oh, Richarlison was the guy on the left. No, Richarlison was never supposed to be on the left. He was supposed to be the number nine with Sonny. We're missing mm. our two left wingers. So I agree completely with you, DJ. I, I think, because considering Perisic isn't coming back, I think left wing is probably the area we need to look at in, in Jan. It's, uh, when you're talking about the um, Kulisewski issue, because obviously we've kind of been hypothesizing about what he can do in the middle of the park, because that's what he said, you know, before the, about being his favorite position, and now he's kind of been give, given that opportunity, and especially with the city game, he's, he did a brilliant job. And uh, I mean, we've seen what he can do, especially in that golden patch, which we hark back to in his first few months. But I think we've seen quite a lot of that as well in this season. I mean, he's been getting a lot of plaudits for for all sorts of aspects of his game. But he he's definitely, I would I would say that you know got he he might not have quite the same arsenal of well, an unfortunate use of word there, but he's he's not quite quite the same repertoire of um you know of, of ability or strategies to beat players. But he does he especially when he's running at players he's. Often does leave a leave a defender with his trickery, um, far more than with his pace. But it's, I, I'm interested in what you guys think because I know this isn't really like you. Both of you are much better at analyzing. I think the tactical side of things. How you've got Johnson and um, Kulisewski because you know when Jim's here, he he's always sort of talks about his thoughts on the long term uh, role of particularly Johnson and. I think seeing him is more likely to be the the player who is chosen on the right. But what do you guys think in terms of where is where is Kulisewski's in particular, but also Johnson? What what's where's the role going to be? How do you see Ange uh, implementing both of them going forward? And uh, is it the sort of thing that you think that he would try different um, different options depending on the situation at the time? Do you want to go, Deej? Sure, I'll go ahead and give it a stab. First off, I would like to preface this by saying, honestly, um, I mean, obviously, this is all just guessing. Anj has a plan. I don't know. I am not Anj. I do play football manager, though. So in that way, we are the same. <laughs> um, but that's about where our similarities end. Um, other, but I, I think that my inclination is that 
Kulisevsky says he wants to play in the center. Kulisevsky is playing well in the center. I think that once he gets more experience playing in the center, I think that he will probably be moved there more or less full time. Mm -hmm. I think that right now it's difficult because he, if we do play him there, he'd be playing with either a Madison or a Lacelso type, uh, or at least we, I would assume so, which means that he needs to be more, he needs to like get more comfortable with not only the attacking necessity of playing as an eight, which he has very well, but he also needs to like learn a bit more about where to be as a Ange eight in the defensive side of the ball, which I think probably mm-hmm. will take a little bit longer, which isn't his fault. He's played as a, a winger for most of his career. Obviously he's played centrally some, but especially as an, as um, in Ange's system, he probably has spent all of his time learning how to be a winger and now has to basically learn another position which is similar in some aspects but different in many others and i think that that's just going to kind of be something that takes time and we'll see if he's able to properly bet into that position if he can't if he then we have oh no we have right wing depth you know like it it, Mm -hmm. that's not the worst thing in the world but i think that's kind of why we're not seeing the kulisevsky central revolution that I think people are wishing to see as quickly as we kind of want to see it. Yeah. I, um, I noticed that um, Andrews asked prior to the West Ham game about Kulu's position. And I said, you know, what's his favorite position? You know, do you think I want to play in the center? And his response was, I don't know what his favorite position is. I don't give the players surveys. Basically they play where I tell them to play. And he said that he sees him more, on the right wing than centrally. Hmm. And I thought that was quite interesting because Kulu's has come out very clearly and said he wants to play in the center. And I always hmm. thought, considering Ange bought Johnson for a lot of money um, and Johnson is a right winger, I thought, okay, that's hmm. clearly where Johnson long-term will hmm. be. I, I think I agree with Jim on that. So then I thought, okay, Kulu, he clearly likes Kulu. Where would that be? So that's why I was agree with you. I hmm. thought centrally, but based on what he said, maybe not. Um, maybe he just will pick players depending on form at the time and we actually will have a competitive as, as you said Deej we actually have competition for, for places um, but I, th- I think you're right it, it might be interesting to be as, as a number 8 um, but we're going to have so many players to choose from even there you know when Basuma and Bentecourt yeah, exactly. come back they're going to be yeah. those those two with Madison will be the exactly. fixed three yeah. Um, so yeah we, we could have just a very good squad um, which you know is what we all want yeah Uh, oh no depth (laughs) exactly yeah i mean i think we've kind of gotten used to as uh supporting tottenham um kind of having the best 11 and then some Mm. players that you throw on to throw a game um (laughs) some of those players are still kicking around but you know yeah we're we're in a process of making a, a solid squad and i think that with that comes selection headaches and Ange will do what he feels is best for the team and i mean he knows his system better than anyone else probably um definitely um so i'm not too stressed about what he just ends up deciding to do with these players if he thinks that kulu's plays better as a as a winger and he decides to use him as depth there so be it we have great wing depth then he decides to play him as an eight wow we have great center mid depth you know like it's a it's a win-win situation he's kulu is a very talented player who can play in multiple positions. And I think that trying to predict where he's going to be in a couple seasons, you know, it's like, yeah. hopefully yeah. it's just still here or we, you know, worst yeah. comes to worst, we sell him for a lot of money, you know? It's also, also like, you know, it's, it's like the, the age of a lot of these players and people were talking yesterday about a doggy and then he's only 20, isn't he? Like it's, yeah. uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of players who are important to us who are still incredibly young. And even when people are, are asking the questions and they're giving out about the you know the run of results and stuff, I think it's really interesting to hear what both of you have just said because you're really talking uh, the way I would be thinking too. Only you're probably more articulate from from the um, the an- analysis of how the players can work together. But it's a, it's far more about where we're going in a year's time. And you know, obviously it's month by month, but it's it's going to take. 
quite a long time. And it was an, another slight diversion, but I think it's interesting to bring up. I, I can't remember. I think it was HG in the um, group this afternoon. He was asking, like, when did Klopp win his first um, trophy? And it was like four seasons that, that it took for him to beat us in the Champions League final. I mean, and, and everybody, always, you know, fair enough, he, he deserves to have the accolades that, that he has and he's done a brilliant job there but the time that he's taken a, a club with even more you would presume impatient supporters who um, a greater sense of entitlement to success with greater um, you know funds and everything else and it, and it still took him all that length of time so I mean yeah it, it's really interesting to hear what you guys have both just um, expressed there because it gives me even more um, sense of um, like just belief that there is uh, a, a far bigger picture and what we're going through now. Like we look back and probably, you know, that's the real think about how fickle uh, football supporters are. In, in a, we would get three wins in a row or something like that. And everybody's like jumping on the, the mental and thing again, you know, it's like, so it, it, it's, this is not very enjoyable uh, in terms of the results, but it's, it's pretty inconsequential, really. I know we want to get into Europe and all that crap, but let's just let's not get ahead of ourselves. How many games have we actually played this? I'll stop looking at that on the table. About fourteen or something. I don't know. You know, yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah, a long, long I, way to go. I think you know, as as well as Klopp, think about you know Lego Head. He went eighth, yeah. eighth, fifth. I mean, yeah. there, I remember their fans calling for his head. The second Big season, time. he finished eighth. Big time. And, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the club stuck by him and look where they mm-hmm. are now. So I, I just hope mm-hmm. we as a fan base and, and the board, more importantly, have got the long-term yeah. vision in mind. Yeah. Can, can I just bring up one, one positive from yesterday? Um, yeah. Obviously, Romero coming back. Yeah. And I thought Basuma's performance, as, as we mentioned in the pre-pod, was impacted by that. Um, mm, and it's, mm. you know, kind of switched him back on. He was able to have more space because Romero was able to drag, the, you know, the attackers onto him, giving Basuma space. So I thought that was obviously, you know, as long as he can stay suspension yeah, yeah. free because he picked up another yellow, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ridiculous yellow, by the way. Absolutely yeah, it was. ridiculous. It, totally won the it ball. wasn't even it was a ridiculous. foul. No, I, can, I can understand giving it, but yeah. like, I don't know. I feel like him and uh, Yudogi specifically... Yeah, just yeah. get get a card every time they commit a foul. Which I I I I guess part of that is because we play such a high line. Every foul that they commit can be seen as stopping a counter. But man, I don't know. There was one. I think that that the ref- so many other players get away with so much more. I was say that the ref really annoyed me. He he called a foul on Adogi for basically shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, and about that's right. A minute later, he gave a foul against yeah. us for the same thing. I was like. What the yeah. hell? Come yeah. on. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it was, it was, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I need to go back and watch some more of these yellows. I don't know. Because, like, that's the thing is, like, people will use that yellow for Romero to talk about the, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. he's he's reckless. That was not mm. a reckless challenge. He went no. around the player. He got great, the ball. The player kicked into his leg. And yeah. then the player was given the foul and Romero was given a yellow. It's so, like, yeah. I don't know. Part of it, yeah, like I said, part of, I think a lot of, Romero is obviously not the calmest player in the world. That much is true. However, he is very good at making those kind of tackles. And I think he is let down by the reputation that precedes him, not necessarily, yeah. not only for who he is, but, you know, the reputation of his, of his country. Yeah. And I guess South America in general, which I think is... Which I find annoying because you know it impacts us negatively. But I'm sure if it was yeah, yeah. someone from another team, I'd love it. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, I think we've probably talked about a bad game um, ad nauseum. So <laughs> let's go on to hopefully a less bad game. Um, we're gonna we're playing Newcastle next, um, which is not an easy fixture by any means. But I mean, really couldn't pick a better time to play them in terms of injury. And suspension with in terms of Tenali. Um yeah, I mean they I haven't seen too much of them this season. I know they got thrashed by Everton, but I think a lot of that was just Everton scoring a late goal and then them trying to equalize because I saw that Everton I don't think scored until 
after the 70th. So I don't know. What do you guys think is, uh, is have either of you guys caught more of Everton or not Everton, Newcastle? Uh, what are we thinking about how we're going to play? Do we think it's just going to be a carbon copy of the last five games, City excluded, because City just exists outside of the realm of football logic? Um, yeah, what do you all think? I, I'd say that, um, I, I mean, I've seen a reasonable amount of Newcastle, and the thing that impresses me about Newcastle is that, especially as you said, Deej, whenever they've got the, the list of players absent, that they have, they've actually been able to, uh, after a really tricky start in terms of their fixture list, and, and they were a good bit down the table, they've actually been consistently um, putting results together. And, you know, they've also been able to kind of combine some very impressive performances in the Champions League and backing up and not letting it affect their league form too much. So I, I think uh, Eddie Howe's done a, a really good job there, to be honest with you. And when they're at home, they're like, it's kind of like the myth of Anfield seems to be the reality of St. James's Park. And they're, I mean, none of us are impressed or delighted about, you know, the reasons behind their, um, you know, their new power from the ownership point of view. But, um, those supporters have been starved for decades, and you wouldn't begrudge them the the pleasure that they have, and that and, and uh, you know they obviously are a huge asset to the team when they're playing at home. And I think they're away from from what I've uh, seen is is definitely a lot more sketchy. Um, so you'd certainly like to think that that's going to be um, work to our advantage. The other thing is, you know, we've we've had a, a really disappointing result yesterday. Like you said, they've they've come off the back of an even heavier defeat against a team that's you know kind of improving but they're still at the wrong end of the table and I did see kind of whenever it was half time in our game we switched over to the Everton game and um I think we saw two goals in that time um and both the the first or certainly the two goals I saw I don't know if it's the first and second or the second or the third but like Kieran Trippier was actually at fault for both of those and um which was quite surprising, but the, takes me the, back. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, the I don't know. Like they've they've definitely had a few games when they've, they've been playing away and they've looked pretty pretty average. So I think, like you said, considering their um, absences, and although we're we've got a lot of our own issues, I think we can put out a strong eleven. If we have Sonny's okay, fingers crossed, I don't know what the story is there. Um, I'd still be pretty hopeful. Um, it should be a good game. And obviously the way that they play um, will, will be quite different, yeah. you'd imagine, to West Ham. So that's definitely going to be, you'd like to think, in our, to our favour as well, that we just have a lot more space to exploit um, when we're going forward. So I think that's definitely a positive for us. Yeah, I, I think I mean, they dominated from what I saw of the stats. I didn't see the game. They dominated the um, possession against Everton, more than 60%. And as, as DJ said, the three goals were the last 10 minutes or something like that. Um, so I, I think it is going to be a pretty open game. You know, as, as you said, um, Johnny, I think Eddie Howe has done a great job, the way Ange has, still maintaining his principles and the way he wants to play football with a second string side. I mean, they've got 13 players out. Um, and you know, hats off to them. You know, obviously there are rivals. We don't want them to do well, but you know, you got to respect when um, when clubs are able to get to get through that. I think I think, and and they still have some decent players. I mean, the front three of Joe Linton, Gordon, and Isaac is still a scary front three in my opinion. So they're even with all these injuries, they're not a side that we're going to walk over. Um, they're going to come and they're going to give us a very good game, and it's going to be a real test for us, especially that back line with. But Davey's still still in the back. So yeah, it'd be, be good. And Pope, yeah, Pope's out I mean, as well, isn't he? Like, I don't yeah, know what their Pope's backup yes. goalkeeper is. Is Dubrovka, he any good? Is there, still, still there, yeah. I believe. Yeah. What's he like? <laughs> Old. Uh. <laughs> That's relative, mate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Remember who old, you're in, old in footballing <laughs> terms. No offense to, to anyone else on this podcast. Um, but I, I don't know. I think, um, like I said, it's a good, it's as good a time as ever to play this team. Um, because like you said, um, Eddie Howe is definitely sticking to his footballing principles. And I think it, for as much as I wish that Newcastle's renaissance had come under different circumstances, I, I mean, their fans are, are mm. diehard. Mm. They're 
they play decent enough football. I like Eddie Howe as a manager. Um, I think that I, I, they're a team that I enjoy watching play. Um, mm. And I mean, it kind of, to be honest, it sucks that they have as many injuries as they do because it would be interesting to see them be more competitive um, than they can be right now. I'm looking at their subs. They brought in Matt Ritchie and Emil Kraft, and those were the only two subs that they could make. Yeah. I think the rest of their bench is basically just youth Kid. and yeah. Paul Dummett and Loris Karius. Um, so it's, yeah, it's. I think it'll be a game we certainly can win. I'm based on the last five games. I am hesitant to say anything about should, um, <laughs> but it's definitely a game that I think will be interesting. Like, uh, like Johnny mentioned, there will be more space for us to exploit because like we've mentioned, Eddie Howe is playing the way that he wants to play and he's not compromising his footballing principles for some injuries um, as is Anj, which I really respect about both of them. Um, but that mm. does mean that there will be more space for us to play. Even if they had a full 11, the way the team's playing right now. And it, I mean, it kind of was the same under Potch, right? Where we play better against teams that don't play low block, which is yeah. why a lot of teams play low block um possession um based football and stuff like that is set up to play well against other teams who do the same which is why we've done so well against teams like liverpool which you know maybe we deserve to win that game if we could if i could switch the liverpool result and the chelsea result canceling out all those injuries i'd do it in a heartbeat but Mm -hmm. um you know, we've played well against teams that try to play expansively and mm. we've done less well against teams that play yeah, definitely. low yep. block, especially the, that we don't have the lock picker in mm. James Madison. Um, yeah, it'll be an interesting game. Um, I am, I'm hoping for a, for a win, obviously. I think it's definitely not outside of the realm of possibility, I think. But like I said... Our form is terrible. You got to take that into it, into account. What do you think I about think... the midfield selection? Do you think sorry? Do you, do you think Sar is going to come into the starting lineup? Um, is Hoiberg going to hold on to his place there? Does he'll start or not? I think we'll probably see an almost unchanged eleven. I eh, I don't know. Maybe there'll be one or two changes. I don't know exactly what those will be, but I think that we'll probably see a structure pretty similar to um, what we saw against West Ham because, um, first of all, having a more defensive-minded player in Hoybier is probably better for a team that's more expansive, like Newcastle is. Mm -hmm. Um, Having Saar is is a very good player, but probably needs a bit more experience around him. And especially with a player like Lo Celso, who doesn't mm. offer that much in terms yes. of um, defensive play. Yeah, yeah. I think that having having someone like Hoybeard, someone who can make a professional foul, who can break up the play, maybe doesn't offer yeah. as much going forward or like buys into the fluidity of the attack as much, um, but mm. is able to like kind of make sure that they aren't able to do what they want to do. Um, in their midfield, I think is is definitely important to have. Um, I hope that Lacelso can play a full ninety because, man, I think that that was kind of the the death of our attacking output yeah. was when he came off. So hopefully, either he can stay uh, stay on for a full game, or we bring in someone like Heal earlier to move uh, Decky centrally. I, I saw that Hoiberg's performances are very... There's a huge contrast between whether he starts and when he comes on as a substitute. The games he started, he hasn't played well. And when he's come as a substitute to shore up the game, he's played well. So that, that's the only one I'm kind of thinking, you know, do, do we want to start him or do we want to bring I mean, him on when hopefully we have the foundation and then he can kind of bring the wise head uh, to calm things down and, and, and to have some game management. Um, yeah. It's a tough one because then if if he doesn't play, that means 
you've got to play Kulu in the middle because I don't think Sar's got the legs to start. Um, sure. And that that means Heel has to start. Um, and, and personally, I, I think he, if Johnson starts, Heel certainly deserves a start because he's done as much as, as Johnson has, in my opinion. Um, and I think these few games are going to be a tell for whether we stick with him or we try and shift him in, you know, in, in mm. the transfer window. Um, so I wouldn't mind if we go back to that and then we can bring on Hoiberg and, and Saar in, in, you know, in the second half and, and maybe push a GLC up and, and Kulu can go out to the wing and, and if needed, Johnson can go on the left. Um, yeah, yeah I, I can't see much change apart from that. Defense mm. is what it is. Attack is what it is. Mm. Um, you know, as like, long as like it's healthy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's mm. that's the key one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of which, I, I do want to mention, we didn't bring up in the West Ham game, that I think Richie um, has been vilified a bit too much for missing that so-called sitter. It wasn't as easy a header as Absolutely. people are, are making out. It was, you know, he's having to go backwards to to get at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's one you'd like him to score, but it's not one mm-hmm. that you can say, "Oh, he's shit because he didn't score it." Exactly. Um, I I completely agree with that. I think it's. I mean, to be fair, it's probably just. It's honestly most of it is just heat of the moment. We lost to West Ham. Yeah. This sucks. Um. So I can understand that, but I don't. I, yeah. It always. Every every we always need a scapegoat as a fan yeah. base. I hate that. That's something that yeah. I mean. That's something every fan base does. But it's it's just not something that's good cause exactly. to do. Because then you're you're just ruining that player's confidence even more than it's already ruined because they're in a bad run of form. And there's nothing positive that you can do about it. What Daniel Levy is not listening to your Twitter tirade about how Richarlison is shit. But Richarlison might read that and it might make him worse. Because yep. he's less confident now, so I don't know. Yeah, don't know. we love to complain. Love to complain. But going back to another positive is that this is a really big week for Newcastle because they've got um, Milan. Oh, yeah. in the Champions League uh, midweek. Um, so I'm obviously hoping that they lose two in a row. Um, but <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, so they, they're going to have to manage their lineup because that Milan game is huge for them. So that could also play into our hands. True. Hopefully, can they manage their lineup? I'm looking at this well, bench, man. Yeah, I know, but th- that's what I'm hoping. Maybe just play some more of their kids. <laughs> you just, you've just guaranteed one of their kids scoring a screamer, yeah. by the way. 30-yard <laughs> pump corner. Yep. Uh, <laughs> as is tradition. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we'll wrap up with some score predictions because, I don't know, I... I it seems like the universe is predicting a 2-1 Tottenham loss, but let's see if we can predict something different. We don't have Mystic Jim here today in his <laughs> in his lucky kit, so... <laughs> exactly. Maybe, maybe we're doomed to lose, but I think I will go ahead and kick us off with a... Um, I'll say a 2-1 two, two, win. I think that the game script will be... I'm just going to hope that the game script is backwards. We come out slow because we had a game on... On Thursday, they score, and then we make changes. Score two in the second. Hold on. I'm 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 going to agree with the the score. I think it's going to be two one. Um, they're going to score because apparently we've conceded in the last six games. I think, um, which which isn't great. Um, we do seem to always manage to score. We always score first. Apart from the derby, we've scored first in every game this season. Um, so I think we're going to go one nil up. I think it's going to be Lo Celso. They're going to score. It's going to be Isaac because we were linked to him. Um, so obviously players we were linked to always score against us. And then the fan base gets mad. Why didn't we buy them? Um, <laughs> and then Richie's going to come on and do a little chicken dance in the last minute after scoring the winner. Now that would be something. No <laughs> Lucas Moore to pass it back to Jota this time. And it'll be um, uh, probably an assist from, from Brennan Johnson to make me look like an idiot for, for the winner. <laughs> Love to see it. All yeah. right, Johnny, what about you? I, I'm going to go with 3-2. I'm going to... Um, yeah, I think give it, just given the, the, the opportunities that are bound to be there and the fact that they are very dangerous, although our keeper is presumably significantly better than theirs, um, I think Vicario is brilliant, isn't he? He's like, what, mm-hmm. what a great signing he's been. So I'd say, I'm going to say 3-2, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray that Sonny's there and he gets a couple and maybe... Maybe Lascelles can get another one, but um, I don't care as long as we win. You know, 
it would be nice to get just... back on. Yeah, get back on the yeah. just trail. Need anything to go yeah. to go right for us. I think um, a win would be nice. Um, but you know, a, a draw, a loss. I'm gonna be honest. It isn't the end of the world. We've yeah. said this going into this. Like the goal of this season is to implement Anja's philosophy and lay the groundwork for us to be able to build upon that in the January window, next summer window, and then windows beyond that. We're not yeah. building. We aren't. We do not. Ha- we cannot because of our financial situation of not being just funded by either a state or someone who is just intent on throwing all of their money away. Um, uh, the Chelsea. Um, we need, we can't do the, the Chelsea thing of hire a manager. We're going to stick with this project, lose three games. Oh, you're gone. Like, I mean, you see Chelsea fan base is already calling for Pochettino to be out, even though, I highly doubt he had much of a say in a lot of the the transfers that came in over the summer, to be honest. They all seem like the same MO of all of the other Bowley signings. Mm-hmm. So even outside of that, the squad that he got before then was like all basically new signings. So I I don't know. We that that kind of mentality might bring trophies once in a while but it can also lead to the situation that's happening over yeah. there and i would much rather be in the situation that we have right now the situation that they're in right now i yeah. think that we need to i mean obviously we've all said this and i think most most fans once they get over the pain of a loss will s- sit back and realize yeah we just we need to back Ange. we need to be patient because rome wasn't built in a day like uh, like we was brought up earlier, Klopp took four years to win a trophy. We need to just have patience. We can see the system being built. We can see that the system works when we're at our best. And we just need to be able to bring in the players, have the players be able to learn so that we can more consistently get to our best. Like, like I've mentioned, I think every podcast for the past couple of podcasts I've been on now, we haven't gotten to the click moment. We yeah. will get to the click moment. And then everyone who tweets the on out stuff for i think it's i honestly i just believe it's just for interactions at this point hmm. we'll look stupid um hmm. but until then we kind of just have to weather this run of bad form and better days are ahead but it, it does look like as well with the, the the kind of structural changes that have happened since around after the conte dismissal you know lots of things have kind of been put in order i know hmm. it's early days um but with a bit of luck, maybe uh, Uncle Daniel will sort of kind of stay in his ivory tower away from the footballing side of things and focus on his lovely property empire. And, um, you know, so so like you said, Deej, there's, there's unlike the Chelsea um, way of de- dealing things, which is like just throwing money and having a sort of scattergun, um, sort of throwing things in there and hoping that they land the right way that's not a sustainable that's not a, that's not a strategy that's actually going to deliver what one would expect us that's what it looks like it doesn't look like that 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 would be it doesn't make sense that that would you wouldn't run a business like that you know so um i think there's there's lots of reasons even from the off the pitch side of things or from the from the structural side of things that give, gives us a lot of more reason to be optimistic as well and and, and the other thing when um Last point I'd make about Sunday's game uh, Sunday. Yeah, um, we've got. And I know this is very dangerous, and I really shouldn't open my mouth. Just like Stu with his um, his <laughs> desire to get young players on the pitch in the Newcastle jersey. But we've got Forest coming up after um, Newcastle. Then we've yeah. got the Everton game. Then we've got uh, Bour- Bright. There's Brighton in there, but um, Bournemouth, Burnley. Um, and then United, at their own fairness, United aren't exactly too intimidating at the moment either. So there's a lot of a lot of potential there. I mean, we kind of looked at the the Chelsea fixture and for you know beyond that, thought well, there's some tricky games in there. And none of us probably thought we'd be picking up as few points as as we have, obviously. But you know, I think we're going to look at that run of fixtures and think there's plenty of points to be had if you know things land the right way and we don't get lucky bounces off or unlucky bounces off players and posts and all of that kind of thing yeah 
No, yeah. I completely agree. Lots to be lots to be confident about. Lots to look forward to. And we've we're got not a... winning the league this year. Oh no. <laughs> we, 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 we also have a game that we played against them that we have to make up for. And I hope some of the players yeah. Oh, yeah. remember that. Oh. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, that, right. I don't think that's so, going to happen again. I guess we will finish with an up the Spurs. Still feels weird to not have Jim. Yeah. That. Yeah. But, done a good uh, job we'll there, finish with an up the Spurs job. and uh, come on, roll on against Newcastle. Hopefully, you know, we win. But if we don't, things still look good. All right. Come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs.